Guys, it has been such a privilege to be here with you this week. Thank you. Thank you for welcoming me. I, I love Netherbridge. I will be back. <laughs> um, so this morning, I don't have a sneaky pocket, so I'm going to be holding this. <laughs> um, I just take a moment because I need to settle my heart. I, I really enjoyed <laughs> that worship, and I really sense that God is here. One of my intercessors last night in the middle of the night emailed me and said, I just feel like you need to proclaim Christ over the room. So I want to do that before we start. So I'm going to pray. <clears throat> Jesus, we recognize you as Lord. You have a word to speak. You have truth to bring. You have a gift for each woman in this room. May we trust your word. If there's anything that is not of you, it does not belong here, and it has to go. We send it to the cross of Christ. Thank you that you have bought us with your blood, that we are your girls, and we are so loved. In Jesus' name, amen. Here we are, our final morning. I want to start, I'm actually going to pray again because I have a planned prayer as well. <laughs> but I want to start with a prayer that John Stott wrote. I think it's commonly called the hospitality prayer. But So would you close your eyes with me again? Would you open your hands? Just put your hands out. We respond to your invitation, O oh God. As we are, we come. We offer to you the hostilities that shape us, the hostilities we carry, the hostilities that carry us. In these matters, move us from hostility to hospitality. Be our guard, for we guard ourselves too much. Be our protector, that we not, need not overprotect ourselves. Create in us a space, a room, a place, free and friendly space where the stranger may be welcomed. That we may be at home in our own house. That we may be healed of the hurts we carry in the soul that we may know brother and sisterhood, that we may know kindness, that we may laugh easily, that we may know beauty. Nudge, guide, entice, prod. Move us to live within your will. To that end, to the end that within this flesh, Within this house in which we live, we may be at home with you, our neighbor, and ourselves. Thus we pray, remembering Christ who says, I stand at the door and knock. Create in us a place of hospitality. Amen. I want that free space. <laughs> So up to this point, we've been talking about the ways that God has hosted us at his table, which has become our table. I want us to look this morning at how he might be inviting us to become the host with him. As we look at the world out there, it can be easy to feel despair. I don't know if anyone's with me in that to wonder how it is that God is working out a good plan. To even know where to begin as we pray and we desi desire to see justice for the brokenness of the world. So I wanna look a bit today at how Jesus invites us to invite and how we can enter into the work he is already doing, firstly by looking 
by truly seeing with the eyes of our heart, and that open the eyes of my heart, Lord. It's a good song for this morning. By speaking life over and by giving a piece of ourselves away. I think about the story that the world is telling, the story that we're hearing, that we absorb every day. We are invited to tell a better story. That's how we give a piece of ourselves away. That's how we see. That's how we invite. When the Pharisees asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? What did he say? He responded by telling them the story of the Good Samaritan. Why did he tell them this story? In this story, he turned their hierarchy on its head. They turn, he turned their prejudice on its head by making their enemy into the hero of the story. The Samaritan was paying attention. He looked and he truly saw the man in the gutter. When no one else saw him, he spoke with compassion and bound up his wounds. And he gave a piece of himself away. He used his own mule. He gave his time. He took the man to the inn. He used his money to pay. And he continued to check back with him. In any other story, a Samaritan would have been regarded with suspicion at the very least, and with contempt, more likely. He would not have been portrayed as the one who did right. In telling this parable, Jesus was inviting those listening to recognize that this table is for everyone. He's done away with any obstacle or barrier that separates in and out. Who's allowed to come? His listeners would have been shocked to hear that not only was the Samaritan invited, but he was valued. And he was the one that was living the values of the kingdom. So the Pharisees were driven by fear, legalism, who's in, who's out, how can I make sure I'm in? Jesus told them a better story. He sang a more beautiful song. I just recently, I was listening to a podcast on my way up here, actually. Um, and he was talking about, in Greek mythology, Orpheus, how he, he travels by the land of the sirens, you know, the beautiful song that makes the, them crash on the rocks. <laughs> but the way that Orpheus made it through was that he sang a more beautiful song. He played a more beautiful tune, and so was not drawn in. That's what we're invited to, to sing a more beautiful song, to tell a more beautiful story. There's another Samaritan, an even more scandalous story, that of a woman, not just a woman, a woman who comes to the well at midday. Let's, le let's look at how Jesus meets her. So remember, just as the good Samaritan, this woman would have been an enemy of the Jews to his audience. There was strife, there was conflict between. <clears throat> not only is she a Samaritan, she's a woman, which in that day was, it was not allowed for men to speak to women, much less to have a conversation. Um, but she was a woman who was in some way an outcast. It's understood in, in the Middle Eastern culture that the women would all come together in the morning to the well to draw water because that's when the day is cool. So the only, only reason you would be coming at midday is if you were, for some reason, not accepted, an outcast. Um, so it's understood that around midday, when Jesus arrived at the well, his disciples had gone away to find food. Tradition was that the women, oh, I've already told you that bit, sorry. <laughs> Um, so, but it is the most awkward time to go. It's hot. There's, you don't want to be there at midday. It's heavy, trying to get the jug of water on her head by herself without help. Um, so she would have been shocked to approach the well and see Jesus sitting on it, not just near it. He doesn't withdraw to a safe distance. He's sitting on the well. And he led with vulnerability and shocking boldness, asking her for a drink. He ignores the divide between Jews and Samaritans, men and women, and scandalously invites her to speak to him. 
So as I read this, I want you just to notice how Jesus looks and truly sees this woman. So I'm gonna read the first half of the story first. Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus asked her, give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well, and he drank from it himself, as did his sons and livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. So Jesus doesn't step in and tell her, I'm God, you need me. He invites her to slowly understand. He draws her in. He starts by seeing her. And he continues to see her when she deflects him, she antagonizes, she attempts to move the conversation to other topics. He crosses over gender, political, and spiritual stereotypes and appeals to her physical need. He intrigues her with the offer of living water. She initially responds through her physical need. That would be great to never have to come draw water at midday again. Then he tells her to call her husband. And she hides. She says, I have no husband. And then what happens? Jesus said to her, go. Call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are saying, you are right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say, that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know the Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Just then his disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking to a woman. 
But no one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away to the town and said to the people, come, see the man who told me everything I ever did. Can this be the Christ? And they went out of the town and were coming to him. This story implies that Jesus took this woman seriously. He was not condemning her by saying she had no husband and calling her out. He was seeing her. He was seeing the entire story of why she had had five husbands, why the man with her now was not her husband. He saw her. He was showing her that he is in a position to offer what he says he can offer. She rightly understands that he is a prophet. Her awareness and interest grows. This woman is good. She knows her stuff. She knows her theology. She knows her politics. She's challenged him. She's deflected him with politics. She now deflects him with religion. This is not just a question about where worship happens. So the Jews believed that the mercy seat, the place where the high priest could offer prayers and where forgiveness is received, was on Mount Zion. The Samaritans believed that the mercy seat, the place where the priest could offer sacrifices and forgiveness is received, was on Mount Gerizim. So this was the conflict. There was an actual physical place where forgiveness could be received. He was exposing her need for forgiveness. She talks about where it can take place. He uses her deflection to break down the barrier to the physical place of worship, sacrifice, atonement, and to introduce himself as the mercy seat. By the time she says, I know the Messiah is coming, he has broken down every barrier to her understanding who, who he is when he says, I who speak to you am he. This is a stunning story of Jesus meeting a woman where she was, saying, I can offer you living water. Let me help you understand. She becomes the first female preacher, runs to the village, as she is seen, she goes to find others. Says, come, see the man who told me everything I ever did. And they come, they follow her. If you think about who she was, she was the wrong woman. <laughs> and yet she had to be. How amazing is that, that God takes her brokenness, takes her who has been outcast, and uses her to bring her entire village to meet him. Just sit with that for a minute, will you? Let that sink in. So he saw her he spoke life over her. He gave a piece of himself away. He gave her his time. He gave her his vulnerability. He said, come and help me. I need water. <clears throat> and he invites her to do the same. Go and tell. Offer your story. Speak my life over the people and bring them to me. This is a process of blessing. This is how we walk in the spirit of God in the world. We bring our story, we speak life over people, and we give a piece of ourselves away. We really try to see them with the eyes of our heart. This is our hospitality. He has come and made his home in us. We get to go 
with him and invite others into that home. So I'm going to tell you my story. And I've got tissues because <laughs> I weep. Um, so I was pretty much born in church. Um, I think I was probably at church the week after I was born. Um, it was a church that loved the Word of God. I grew up learning to study Scripture. I learned how to dissect scripture, how to understand scripture. I memorized it. It was in me. I learned how to serve. We went on mission trips. We slept on church floors. <laughs> we served. We did service projects. And I learned to lead. I learned that I had some leadership in me. And I was in high school when I first did my first leadership ex kind of outing experience. My experience of, the, of Jesus was good. Jesus is with me. My experience of the Father was that he was stern. I couldn't approach him. I wasn't allowed. My experience of the Holy Spirit was suspect. Honestly. Don't trust him. It was really the experience that I had. Um, and I wouldn't have articulated any of that. <laughs> that was just looking back. That's probably what I experienced of the Holy Spirit, or of the Trinity. Um, so as I grew up, some of the things I learned was that as a leader, I was not allowed to experience that what I got was for other people. So God gives me a word, it's for you. <laughs> always, always. Um, although he didn't give me words then because I didn't believe in the Holy Spirit. Um, <laughs> he'd give me pictures though and that was okay because it wasn't, wasn't really, it was just my thoughts. Um, we'll get to that later. He also, I also learned that there was only a very restricted level, area of ministry that I was allowed to be involved in because I was a woman. So my first 19 years grew, oh, I knew scripture. And I, I loved scripture, I loved memorizing it. I had my 10 minutes of quiet time a day to make sure I had the habit. You know, I, that was my experience. Um, And at 19, it fell apart. I'd gone away to uni. I'd run out of money. I've discovered I wasn't as good at what I thought I was studying as I thought I was. <laughs> and I came home. And I felt like I had failed. The first time in my life, I felt like I had failed. I felt humiliated because I'd gone away to college and come back. I hadn't succeeded, I hadn't ended with a degree. I felt devastated. For about four years, I wandered around, wafted about in the wind, as a phrase a friend of mine came with. I think that's such a good word. <laughs> Blowing from one thing to the next. I was moving around a lot. I went home to my parents. I went back to where I'd lived. I then moved to somewhere else, and then moved back to where I loved. I was, I was all over the map, geographically, spiritually, emotionally. I was depressed, aimless, hopeless. There were two people in that time that walked that road with me in a way I will never forget. One of them is still one of my best friends today. Her name's Debbie. I just give her a shout out. Because <laughs> she, what we talked about last night, she was presence to me. I don't even know if she would understand how deep she was presence to me. When I was deep in this hole and could not come out, she was there. She didn't try to fix me. She didn't know any of the rules. She just sat with me. <laughs> um, 
And there was a man called Darren who introduced me to Henry Nowen and his book, The Return of the Prodigal Son. It was in that time that I realized that there is grace for the older brother. I saw Jesus' invitation to him, come into the party, come and be with me. And up to that point, all I knew was that I needed to be good. And oh, I was good. (laughs) All of this time, my heart was still very older brother. But Jesus was inviting me, come to the party, come and be with me. So when I was 23, I met Darshel. I'm trying to tell you the people that were involved in presence for me and in Christ meeting me. Darshel, she loved Jesus. She was like no other woman I'd met. She was about 25 years older than me. We sang on a worship team together, and this was our posture. So I was... Raise my hand once in a while. You know, I mean, it was just, it was very buttoned up, very okay. Darshel's next to me. Wow, Jesus, you're good. And I'm looking at her going, what? I need to get to know this woman. She was fantastic. Darshel. Oh, I wish I could just sit in front of her and tell her what she meant to me. She introduced me to the Holy Spirit, to the full work of what the Holy Spirit can do and what he wants to do. She took me to conferences, kind of about the work of the Holy Spirit. I remember we went to this one inner healing prayer and I learned about the prayer of um, lining up with the Spirit. So body, line up under my soul. Soul, line up under my spirit. Spirit, line up under the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, I only want to hear from you. And I'm listening to this going... what if I hear something different? She's like, but you've lined yourself up. You're not, you know, so, but this was, she was opening my eyes to see, you can trust the Holy Spirit. He is good. He is for you. And he will glorify himself in what he says. She taught me to prayer walk. So Darcel, fantastic woman. I was doing youth ministry at this point. I kind of come out of the darkness and was, working with high school students. Darshel said, Jenny, let's go prayer walk the high schools. I'm like, woof, okay. (laughs) And she said, right, I'm gonna get permission. So she called, there were four really big high schools in her area that our youth group drew from. And she got permission, so six o'clock, once a week, we went to a different high school. We anointed lockers with oil. I was like, whoa, what are we doing? (laughs) We were, we were, you know, she just prayed in a way that I thought, oh my goodness, there's power. I want what you have. And all this process, Darshel, she didn't even know it. She was mentoring me. She was teaching me the ways of the Holy Spirit. She was teaching me to trust, teaching me to trust his voice in me. And she was teaching me that he has a purpose. He has a good plan. He is a good God. So throughout this process, I, um, so I was 23 then, that was kind of 23, 27, 28, I entered seminary. So I went back, finished my degree, which I was really proud of, <laughs> second person in my family to finish university, I was like, yeah. Um, but I went to seminary and my world was rocked. That's a long story that I'm not gonna tell you <laughs> about how I got there. But this was the kind of stuff we were talking about. It was, the Father is relational. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit want to know you. That scripture is not just words on a page. That God wants to bring it to life. And I experienced in those times, I was in seminary for three years, I had a couple of really poignant moments of just freedom and standing up taller. One of them was I had panic attacks for years. In the middle of the night, I would wake up frozen with fear. And it would happen like three nights in a row, and then I wouldn't have it for a while, and then I'd come back again. And I was sharing this with, I'd gone on a long solitude retreat for three weeks, and in that time, I'd had a couple of nights of this. So I was kind of debriefing my experience and sharing it, and one of my professors said, well, 
you ever thought about just asking Jesus to come with you into it? I was like, okay. <laughs> so the next time this happened, I was almost anticipating. I'm like, come on, bring it. <laughs> so a night came, it was the middle of the night. I woke up and I was like, oh, here it comes, here it comes. I was like, okay, Jesus, take my hand and walk me through it. And we walked all the way through the fear. And there were specific things I was afraid of. We walked through what would happen if, and then what would happen, and then what would happen, and then what would happen. We got to the very end of it, and I realized that my deep fear was that Jesus would leave me alone in it. He ministered to me alone in my bedroom, and that was gone. I've never had one of those nights again. That was the Holy Spirit. That was Jesus meeting me, walking through it. Um, so just experienced this really deep healing, experienced being seen. There was a small cohort of us, there were 30 of us in the group, and we walked three years together of this journey of seeing each other, of living together. We didn't actually live in community, but we saw each other every day. <laughs> and of really hearing the deep stuff and speaking truth over each other. And it was so transformative for me. Um, so I graduated. At 30, was recruited to come to Scotland. <laughs> I'd never been, I thought, oh, okay, that, that's a change. Um, but there was a team here that was looking for a spiritual director, someone who could walk alongside. Um, they, had, they were doing kind of missions, training, and discernment, and so they'd hired me to walk alongside and help in that process of people discerning, am I called to ministry? So, yeah, I can do that. So I showed up, and zero experience of Britain, Scotland, cold turkey. And it was hard, because <laughs> I came from California. <laughs> but I loved it. I really began to engage and to learn and to recognize just the give and take of our cultures. Um, and two years later, everything fell apart. It was very similar to what had happened before, but different in one way, in that I saw the Holy Spirit at work. I submitted and I surrendered. And I, I went through then two years of discerning, of really stepping out and standing in who I was. And again, I'm giving you the short version, <laughs> but there was this, this journey of recognizing that I am not only loved for what I do, I am loved in the mess. I think I wept for about four months straight in that time. And then I noticed I wept a little bit less, a little bit less. And then I noticed that I was feeling like I could step into things again. And that was such a powerful time. There were two years of, again, it, it could have been seen as wafting about in the wind, but there was a very clear presence of God walking me through it and through really a space of stepping into who I was. I went through some conflicts and having to talk to some powerful women that I've respected highly and to say, I think you've actually not seen me. Can we talk about that? And those things just made me actually come out and stand up and say, I am welcome in the room. I had this deep lie that I'm not welcome in the room. And that wasn't true. So to be able to step into that. Um, and I realized one day that I no, no longer felt that shame, that sense of, I'm not welcome. So the last, I'm not gonna tell you as much the last seven years. It's, it's been a powerful seven years. There's been a lot happening. Um, but there's been a daily walking out of these true things about me. There's a choice to say, I belong in the room. I am welcome at the table. The gifts that God has given me are to be used for you, but also for me. And that it's never a one-way street. Some of the most powerful examples of leadership that I've experienced have been women who were willing to give and take. 
And for me, going right back to that experience of being a leader when I was younger, to walk into realizing that I could lead and I could be vulnerable was a huge, huge step. And so I come to the present day and I'm standing before you without fear, without a little niggle in the back of my mind, like, are they going to find me out? Because I know who I am. I know who Christ has made me to be. And that, women, is my better story. That is me saying, come and see the man who showed me everything I did and has given me living, living water. And my story is not over, thankfully, because I know there's places I still need to be free. And God will deal with those when we get to them. And I'm excited, <laughs> with a little bit of trepidation. Um, but I want us to step into that and just recognize we are free. Our stories are important. And God is taking us on a journey. So as we look at the world through our story, through the eyes of what God has done, how do we come to bless? What aspects of my story connect with another? And how do we bring that better story? And I think, think of the close places. Who are the people in my neighborhood? Who are the people Jesus wants me to see? But I also think of the big story. How do we look at the world through the lenses of the love of God? What are the places of brokenness to which I am most drawn? We are not called to the same places of brokenness in the world. The church, the body of Christ, has many different gifts, many functions. We need to look for the place where our passion meets the brokenness of the world. There's a book, Courage and Calling, by Gordon T. Smith, that's just fantastic, but that's what he says. Look for the place where your passion meets the brokenness of the world. Where do you feel constantly called to pray? And pray into that. So whether it's someone close, or whether it's a big story, how is God asking me to look and to see? Really see, watch the news and look and really see what's happening. Look at the eyes of the people in the pictures in the magazines, in the, in the newspaper. Look at them. Ask God for the eyes to see. Speak life over them. Doesn't, care, doesn't matter if they're in front of you or not. Speak life over them. Pray for the people you see in the pictures. <laughs> And how do we give a piece of ourselves away? And if someone's close up, that's gonna look different to if we're looking at the big picture, at someone far away. But there is always a way to give a piece of ourselves away. How is God asking me to pray? Is there an act he is asking me to do as an act of intercession? My husband once gave up coffee for 40 days to pray for people in poverty. <laughs> and I was like, Whew. But that was so powerful because he actually gave something up to remind him to intercede. It was a fast of sorts. Gave this up so that God would remind him to intercede. Whenever he was going to have his cup of coffee, he went into a place of abiding for and with um, people in poverty. So think about that. And finally... As we bless, as we invite, as we love, what is the final better story? Where are we headed? We need to remember this. The end goal of all of this is not simply that we live better lives or that we get along better or that we feel better about ourselves. We are preparing ourselves for an eternity to come. I would just like to address one final myth potentially. <laughs> Our eternity is not sitting in the clouds and playing a harp. Our eternity is not an eternal church service. Our, our eternity is with Christ, with each other.
and it's going to it's going to be a lot like here only perfect just think about revelation talks about heaven and earth are going to be reunited and we're going to see the trees we're going to see the forests we're going to see the beauty we're going to recognize things in heaven he is making all things new he is inviting us to a feast beyond all feasts this earth redeemed is where we will spend eternity with God. This is a much bigger conversation. <laughs> I would encourage you to have it if you're interested in knowing more about heaven. Might I recommend this book, Heaven by Randy Alcorn. Oh my, I've been working my way through it for about four years. <laughs> Just, oh. um, <clears throat> he says all the questions you ask about, want to ask about Kevin, heaven but are afraid to ask. <laughs> But I want to close our time just by reading to you about where we are going. The final table. Except I forgot to mark it. I'm going to read you two passages briefly. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude like the roar of my, many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. His bride has made herself ready. His bride has made herself ready. It was granted to her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. I fell down at his feet and worshiped him. But he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And then, that's only the marriage supper. That's the beginning. And then we get to grow. We get to live with him. We get to learn. And then, just close you with this last picture. The angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God, and of the lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also, on either side of the river, the tree of life, with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the lamb will be in it. His servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. Women, this is what's coming. This is what we're invited to. What we do now matters. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus.